Welcome back, fight fans, to the Shadow Fight Podcast. I believe this is number 96. And as you can see beside me, we have another uh, feature fight from the Fight Life promotion happening uh, April 5th up in Edmonton. Mr. Scott McKenzie. Scott, thanks for coming in, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've been uh, listening to the podcast. I maybe didn't hit all 96 episodes, but... Well, get to work. Quite a few of them. <laughs> hey, I'm going to be real with you, man. Uh, I would have... I would have asked you a long time ago to do this, but uh, I always felt like you're a super kind of quiet, personal guy. I was like, I oh, probably doesn't want to sit down and talk for an hour. So I really appreciate you doing this, man. No, absolutely. I feel like people maybe have uh, that uh, idea about me because I do come across kind of serious, but uh, I'm definitely not not super serious. Don't take myself super seriously. So oh, there you go. Yeah, glad to be here to chat. Nice, man. Nice. Um, now, just getting out of winter here, you got a fight coming up. Um, Oct- on sorry, April fifth. Let's start there real quick. Uh, how's that been going? You're fighting somebody, maybe not a familiar opponent in the ring, but somebody you got to have some eyes on quite a bit lately. Yeah, for sure. So fighting uh, Dan Keshigo, um, April fifth. Uh, it's gonna be a great fight. Um, really excited for the opportunity to fight again close to home, and um, against such a good opponent. Um, I've actually, like, yeah, I've seen him fight on Muay Thai World Cup. We've actually shared a dressing room when Quinn fought uh, Cody. Mike Doherty. Oh, Mike Doherty, right, yeah. right, yeah. And uh, so I've chatted with him. I like him. He's a great guy. I think he represents the sport really well. He's got that good kind of warrior mentality. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just going to be a great fight. So, yeah, so you got a, a few minutes uh, or a few times to watch uh, Daniel Kisha go fight. Before it's fight time, anything uh, anything you notice? Anything you want to let us in on about uh, maybe not a game plan per se, but, you know, anything caught your eye? I mean, it's no uh, – you don't have to even be well-versed in the sport to know he's got bombs in his hands. No joke, no joke. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's a good example of a fighter who can come back from adversity. There's a lot of fighters who, if they lose a round, they're going to lose the fight. Right. But uh, good call. you've seen him, like, like on the verge of defeat, come back and just starch people. And so, yep. like, and I feel like I have that capability as well. I've done that as in proven. the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, just got to... Got to go in there with a smart game plan. Be mindful of his hands. I mean, we're both southpaws. Weird shit happens when southpaws fight each other. So uh, it, I just think our styles match up really well. It's going to make for a great fight. And just because I know how tough he is and how uh, how durable he is, th- I'm just like prepared for a five round bell to bell. Let's go. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now I was pretty surprised to hear um, this this fight get announced simply because as far as I knew now I don't know a lot about Daniel to be honest but he fought at 154 and if I'm wrong normally you would fight at 165 yeah I did most of my career at super middleweight 165 uh 168 was WBC super middleweight but uh I also spent most of my career barely cutting weight um oh, okay like I didn't really know how to cut weight properly so I would just try to sweat it all out yeah. so I really didn't cut that much weight I would get I would weigh in at 165 and then I'd get back in the ring at like really low 170s. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Even the biggest I got, I think, was when I fought for the WBC belt um, just because I knew Phil was big. So I just like spent that whole camp lifting weights and eating. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I cut and I learned how to cut weight smarter for that fight. But uh, pretty much, yeah, I just didn't really cut weight now that I know how to cut weight smart and I'm actually walking around lighter than I used to which okay. is kind of weird considering I'm a, a little bit older now sure sure yeah but uh it's just going to be much easier for me and I think 160 is a way more natural weight class for where I'm at with my body weight and the reality is man you're huge you're gonna be massive at 160 you know that let's be real you're a big dude man you're not the smallest guy out there <laughs> yeah. um were you surprised when this matchup got announced um, or, or that offer was given to you? Like, how did this come about? Or, or were you surprised? Or were you, were you almost thinking this might line up? Or I was a little bit surprised, to be honest, just because I thought he might just keep it rolling with uh, Muay Thai World Cup here in Calgary mm. because he was coming out of the tournament. Right. But, uh, I mean, when you're in Canada, like, we love to pretend that... <laughs> middleweight and super middleweight are these deep divisions let's make rankings and there's 10 fighters in each ranking Mm -hmm. but like they're not deep like there's a handful of dudes at the 
at the top who can compete. Like for years yeah, right. and years, it was like me, Derek, and Jake McKenzie. Yeah, kinda that's right. Orbiting. That's that, right. That's that right. Spot and um, it's just yeah at the top of like an A class division in Canada and those two weight classes, there's a handful of guys. So yeah. if some of them are booked up or whatever, then I guess the the pieces have to match up a certain way. Sure, sure. And and without being disrespectful to anybody, of course, but for sure, you, Derek, and Jake, Jake McKenzie. And then the funny part is, can anybody, you, not you per se, but you listening, watching, name me a, name me a fourth. That's what I thought, right? Like besides you three, it's hard to name another guy at that, that, that yeah, weight class for the like most part. Over the years, there's been some like up and comers, but like people don't just like stick around, you know, yeah. like there's very few people who stick around for like 10 years and yeah. like yeah. are still fighting. So like sometimes I'll see these young guys coming up and I'm like, oh man, that guy would be a good fight in like two or three years when he's had a bunch of fights and then he'll discover something else or gets right. a girlfriend, has a kid or who knows, you know, yeah. life, life takes people in different directions. So sure does. Yeah. So what is it? Do you think that's the difference between the 10 year plus people and not what, what, what makes it get past 10 years in your mind? Cause I think you're right. Bang on by the way. Yeah, I don't know. I just think that you have to be a different kind of person to stick with it that long, especially in such a thankless sport no as kid, man. Can Canadian Muay Thai. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like definitely not lucrative. You're getting hurt all the time. It's hard to find fights. Um, You're I think paying for your way to get there yeah, when you do find them. Oh, absolutely. Like the amount of money I've spent on my career and I've fundraised, like to get me and my coaches different places is pretty astronomical. I tell other athletes about it sometimes and they're just like, why do you do that sport? <laughs> it makes no sense. But I th to answer your question, I think the 10 year thing, it just, if you can stick it out in this sport that long, it sets you apart completely from people who just kind of dabble. And yeah. by then you've probably had good fights you've had hard fights you've lost maybe a couple times like you some just, bad losses some good wins all that stuff in between. yeah exactly yeah. so it just kind of crafts and creates you into someone who is a much more like durable and uh skilled athlete overall i would say yeah um listening to you talk about it it's it's the reality of uh don't you know especially fighting in muay thai look at some of these guys with three four hundred plus fights this is the long game, right? Not the short game. No, otherwise, you're going to be gone in less than 10 years. Yeah, no, I think so, for sure. Um, interesting you said that, but um, a couple of things. So now that you're a little older in the career, if you're past the 10 years, the first 10 years, it's easy. Oh, I love Muay Thai. Muay Thai is my life, blah, blah, blah. After everything you just said, it's not lucrative. You got to pay this, the amount of spend, the fundraising. So why do you continue to do it? Um, I don't know. I'm just... I'm obsessed with Muay Thai. Like, uh, preach, buddy. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I love I love it. And like, I used to work in an office job, and uh, now I train and I train people and I teach strength and conditioning or whatever. And like, all the time, I'll like look down and I'm wearing like shiny pink shorts from FA Group in <laughs> Bangkok, and I'm like. I'm wearing this to the fucking office today. This That's is right. pretty <laughs> awesome, you know? Oh, That's sorry, true. I don't know if I can score Fuck shit, here. tits, whatever you want, buddy. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so, I, yeah, not only that, but I just think it allows, the sport itself allows me to express my true, authentic self, and uh, there's very few things that anyone has in their life that allows them to do that. And, yep. uh, yeah, I just, I love the process of getting better, like, even if I didn't have such a wicked team to train with, like you guys have probably seen, I'm like always hitting the heavy bag. I don't think always. any, I don't think anyone hit more rounds on the heavy bag, especially during COVID than, than I hit. I would wear, I believe you. wear gloves out. I yeah. still do. Yeah. I just love the process of like constantly learning and refining. Yeah. It's just fun. What, what, uh, what in your repertoire now are you looking to get better at or trying to increase? Um, there's always little things like, especially, like learning from Jake. Jake's just got such a unique eye on the of the sport and uh he's like always thinking of little tweaks and adjustments to techniques. Yeah. Cuz like that's really what it is. Like everyone knows how to punch, kick, knee, elbow, whatever it is, but yeah. then it's all these like little tweaks and different setups and yeah. kind of tricks and and uh just ways that you can like refine the fundamentals even just to make it that much more effective. That's right. right. Yeah. So there's most like 
nothing crazy. Like I'm not going to be like, Oh, I want to, I really want to jam land like a rolling thunder kick or something like that's not, that's not yeah. me. Please don't do that. I'll <laughs> yeah, make fun no. of you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. But, uh, yeah, just, just getting better, better at everything. Just constantly improving every little, every little thing. Sometimes I'm like on a kick where I'm like, I really want to like just clinch everybody or like, I really want to like try to switch stances and like, Right. Pretend I'm Eddie Abasolo. When he circles over there, I'll just shift into orthodox <laughs> or whatever. As smooth you know? as you can make it look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just just little things like that. There's always little wrinkles you can add to your game. Sure. The the, the pursuit of perfection, even though you know it's never coming. Yeah, right? exactly. For sure. Yeah. The other the other way I explain to like students is um so about 25, 30 feet from us right now, there's my mirrors. If I draw a circle and from back here, you go, hey, that's a pretty good looking circle. But as you get closer, you recognize, oh, you see all the bumps and lumps and I missed. And the whole point of it is just smooth out the edges of that circle, right? Yeah, Try yeah. to make it a perfect circle. Um, martial arts is for life. You know, that's, that, that's even with, with fighters out of here. And, and I, I, you know, God bless Chris McMillan, who, who very much understands that there's life after fighting. Now he's heavily involved in fighting, but on the other side of the ropes kind of thing. But if there's anything I try to preach to people, there's life after fighting. You can teach, you, you can open your own gym, you can go to work in your favorite pair of silly shorts. <laughs> and, you know, like there, there's very few people, in my opinion, that that have a passion in life like we do. You know, you, me, Jake, Chris, all those guys. So, yeah, I, I, I feel, you know, what's that silly saying? Uh, you never work a, if you like what you love, what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So take us back to uh, your martial arts journey. How did... I, I got to know, man. I keep staring at this thing on your neck. What is that? Uh, it's actually, it looks like some kind of crazy tooth, but it's a carved yak bone. I got it uh, no way. in the amulet market in Bangkok. Oh, nice, yeah, man. Stumbled in there randomly. I was on the river boat and I was so hot. And I was like, I'm just getting off at the next stop. Right. And I went into this like underground amulet market. And I was like <laughs> the only white guy in there. <laughs> I was like, oh, there's some cool shit in here. So I got this. And uh, then like, Thai people are very superstitious, mm -hmm. but like everywhere I went after when, if I was wearing this, people would like come up and grab it and be like, oh, very strong, very hmm. strong. So is <laughs> there, so, a, I don't know. Besides, besides you thinking it's cool, is it, is there a meaning behind it from the Thais, like from the superstition side? I mean, I guess it's just supposed to be like strength and protection. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so great, man. Works for me. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, <laughs> man. So sorry. Now that that my ADD yeah, got in the way there. Wondering if you can, uh, how, how did martial arts come into your life and, and uh, you know, how did you start fighting and all that good stuff? Um, I d actually didn't even really do any martial arts until I was almost done university. Like I was okay. pretty much 22. Like I would watch Bruce Lee movies with friends and mess around with nunchucks. And one of my friends like had the rest one of, of those us. like wave master heavy bags. <laughs> You'd flail, flail around on that and skin your knuckles. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I never did any like organized martial arts until I was, I think I was like pretty much done university and I joined, um, Mike Miles used to have a ranch lands location, That's right. yep. which is pretty close to where I lived at the time. So I joined up at that gym and, uh, yeah, I just, for the first like while I trained, I kept running out of money cause I was like kind of a poor student. Sure. So I would train, like they would let you buy three months at a time. Right. So Take I three months for off. three months. Then I like wouldn't go for a while and then I would like go again. And then I remember I did like a continuous tournament and one of the coaches there was like, Oh, you, you know, like you're actually pretty good at this. Like you're pretty athletic. You're picking it up pretty quick. Like you got punched in the face and you're didn't cry, cool fall apart. It. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's so, 90% of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was like, okay, cool. And then, uh, Shortly after that was when Trevor's gym separated mm -hmm. and uh, I was kind of like not part of the fight team. So I just stayed at Mike Miles and I went to the South location. Mm. And then from there, I just started going to f asked if I could go to fighters class, which was like um, much more high intensity than what I was used to. Sure. And like introduced like more sparring and stuff like that. And then, yeah, yeah I just kind of got into it. I did the whole like couple more continuous things and then smoker fights and then finally got on a fight card in my opinion the proper way of doing it yeah start, totally. just take, take little bites yeah build it up everyone wants to start off in the ring as an amateur but like you got to realize too when there's not that many cards going on like that's limited real real estate right yep, so yep. You got to work it, work it up this the smart way and uh, earn your spot on those fight cards damn right that's a good way to say it yeah uh, yeah earn, earn your way in you got it um now, before you started martial arts, so I, I see you quite a good skateboarder, yeah? 
Is that, and was that something that's been sort of in your athleticness before fighting? Like, is that something you've been doing for a long time? Yeah, skateboarding was definitely like the first obsession. I used to skate, um, I think I started in like grade four or five, and I skated pretty seriously up until like the end of high school and um, had like a few wow. sp sponsors along the way. And like, I literally used to just skate like all day, every day. Like, I, that's why is I was, that right? I think eh? That's why I was so skinny because I lived on like slurpees and skateboarding <laughs> for like eight yeah. hours a day <laughs> holy shit yeah um now that you're a little bit older you still i still see you out there skateboarding yeah yeah a little bit it's like hard now because i still want to try to progress and do the tricks that i used to do and then you fall and your wrist is fucked for like six months yeah man yeah <laughs> that's my whole thing even watching you do these things i'm like my palms are sweating. like oh, yeah. please don't fall man please don't fall is that is that now that you're a little older is that something that's like, you know, like a thought, you know, when you're skateboarding or... You know. Yeah, definitely. And people people remind me that too. Like my physio is like, dude, your playing surface is concrete and your success rate is like 5%. <laughs> He's right. like, it's just a bad recipe for injuring yourself. He's like, as soon as you get a fight lined up, put the skateboard away. Sure. <laughs> So. E easy to say when your other passion is slamming shins into <laughs> someone's head. Like, yeah, you know? true, true. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like, uh, so your first class, was was that something like love at first sight? Did it take a while? What, what, what got you into like, hey, man, I, I think I want to compete? E even as a, even at the continuous, was there something there that happened where like, just like, holy shit, man, I, I'm, I want this. Like, did something happen? Was there a, was there a defining moment? Um, I would just say I, I picked it up pretty quick and I was good at it. Like, I'm, I would consider myself fairly athletic. And, it's a fair uh, statement. Yeah. And, um, I, yeah, I was just good at it. I don't think I lost a single boat in all my continuous tournaments. I got disqualified once for kneeing somebody in the face. Nice. <laughs> he he <laughs> ducked out of the clinch. That was his, his fault. Hey, don't break posture <laughs> in the clinch, man. That'll yeah. happen. And, uh, yeah, no, and I just – I'm really competitive, um, but not, like, to a fault. Like, I wouldn't consider myself, like – Michael Jordan competitive where I make everything not fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm very competitive. I like to win, and uh, I just was good at it, and I really enjoyed fighting. I like uh, I like the competitive aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. And was it much like skateboarding? Uh, although it's it's fighting very much as a team thing outside of game time. Um, is, is there something about having it be an individual sport a little bit that has to do with it? Once it's game time, of course. We all know behind the scenes at the team. Right? Yeah, definitely. And I would say it definitely has a lot in common with skateboarding. And even though it's an individual sport, there's like a whole like subculture and community huh. that you're mm -hmm. a part of. And uh, if you find a good community, like I've found at uh, Dunamis, like it's like your family basically. Right, right. right. Like, Shout out to Dunamis, obviously, yeah. everybody over there. I spend so much time with those guys every week that like, if it if it's not a good fit, like it's just not gonna work. Yep. And, and uh, if there's anything, I could honestly say that's what I'm jealous about. My gym is you guys are such a tight knit group over there that I I I'm jealous. I want some of that in in my gym. I, I, we used to have it, you know, it has its ebbs and flows, but I see it. I I know what it's like, and I I wish we could have more of that here. That's that's so important to have that, right? Yeah, the community that Jake and Krista have built over there is like pretty second to none. Yeah, and for it's sure. like. I think it catches some people off guard sometimes how nice and welcoming and like community vibe it is. Like mm. when you go in there, like your knuckles will be sore from being like, Hey, Hey, how's it going? Nice. How's it going? Like everybody wants to give you the knuckles, like ask you how you're doing. Like right. people hang out outside the gym. Right. Too. That's what like, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so at that point, it's not about, I have to go and work out. Oh, it's about, Oh shit. I can't wait to see all my friends get some sore knuckles. Yeah, you know? totally. That's yeah. great, man. No, and I try to remind myself of that even when you're grinding in fight camp. It's like, no, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. This right, is awesome. Right, right. Yeah. Especially as you get older, right? It's yeah. easy to go through the motions, right? Yeah. Good for you, man. That's that's cool to hear. Um, so what was it about, let's say, uh, do you remember your first amateur fight? Uh, yeah. Where was that? Kind of, sort of. Okay. It was at the, I say kind of, sort of, because I basically had like an adrenaline blackout. Sure, <laughs> sure. But uh, it was at the Boness Sportsplex, the mighty, nice. the mighty Boness Sportsplex. Nice. And um, our warm-up room was, uh, I think it was uh, like a hockey dressing room because right. I remember it was like really cold and it had that like kind of tarry floor yeah. that your skate blades That's don't right. stick into. That's right. Or like it won't dull your skate blades so bad. Right. Great for rotation. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I fought a guy from uh, Airdrie 
named Derek, and he's not fighting. I don't think he fought after that. Okay. I, I won. Uh, I can't remember what round it was, but it was a face teep KO. Nice. And it kind of scared the crap out of me. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Are you like, okay? That could have happened to me. Right, yeah. right. I don't know. If there's anything, I, I try to, re that's perfect. I tell my, my, my people who want to fight, you know, like, what's your plan for Monday? And they go, what do you mean? I'm like, what if you get teeped in the face, your nose and jaw gets broken? What's your plan? I'm like, oh, I don't know. So usually what I say is, listen, we'll just keep training. Usually what I'm looking for is, what's your plan for Monday? Like, Fuck Monday, let's go. Yeah. Like, okay, we can fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't think too far ahead. That's right, that's right. Um. So uh, was that at 165 as well? Do you, I don't do you recall? even remember. I used to fight like at whatever. Like I remember a couple of my smokers just weighing in with all my clothes on because the guy was like, oh, I thought the fight was at 190. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, Call okay, me. like how, how much, how many rocks do I need to put in my pockets no kidding, to make hey. this work? That's a common thing you hear, hey? Yeah. Um, so how, how long was it after your first amateur fight that uh, you had your first title fight? Um... I think my first amateur fight was in 2012 and I was actually kind of, I had bad luck. I was like plagued with injuries after my fights. I would like win by KO in the first or second round and I'd break my foot. Okay. Or, like I broke my feet so many times in fights. I broke my shin once early on and, uh, Jesus. So I would like win and then I'd be like, cool. Now I'm out for like eight, 10 weeks. Right. So right. it took a while to actually accumulate some fights, but my first title fight, was in, I know what month it was. I can't remember what year. I think it might have been 2013 or 14 mm. in September. And it was against a guy from Airdrie named Andrew Vandervelden. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shout out to Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, nice guy. Nice. Right on, man. Yeah. And did it come away with any injuries in that one? Um, I think I broke my foot. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that something you have to deal with today? Broken feet? Um. It is a little bit in that, like, uh, just because I've broken my feet a bunch. Like, I broke my feet a bunch skateboarding before I, I even did Muay Thai, just jumping down handrails and stairs and stuff. Jeez. And um, <laughs> so my feet are definitely a little bit of an issue. Um, I don't run a lot. Okay. I, I climb a lot of mountains. Yes, you do. That's kind of my, like, long-duration cardio. I don't do a lot of running. Like, this fight camp, I don't think I've run a single step. Is that right, hey? Yeah, and, like, for my WBC fight, didn't run a single step. Is that to save your feet, or you, you just found there's a different different way to do it? Uh, or both, both maybe. Both, yeah. 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 yeah, I suppose. That makes sense. So I forgot, man. You fucking climb mountains, too. Where does this come from? Like, you, you don't just kind of, like, listen, and when there's me climbing mountains, and then there's you climbing mountains. Where, where did all that come from? Like, that's, a, that's, not, a, that's not a hobby. That's a skill that, that clearly that you do. Where, where did that come from? Um, I, got, I got into hiking... My grandpa was uh, a really avid hiker. He was hiking into his 70s with two artificial hips. What? Yeah, he's no a way. Yeah, super badass. I have a bunch of his scrapbooks, and I try to try to climb some of the mountains that he did, and uh, always think about him when I'm out there. But um, started when I was like pretty young, and then in university, I got into it with some buddies. But like lately, in the last maybe three years, I've taken it more seriously. And I do what's called like scrambling, which is right. like like climbing without ropes. Right. So it's kind of like it. I would say it's less technical than rock climbing, but it's more dangerous because if you fall, there's no protection. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, that's some dangerous shit, man. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's fun though. I don't know. I just like it goes kind of hand in hand with my love of dangerous and challenging things. Sure. Winning. But, and just getting out in nature like i like to do a lot of stuff by myself out there too like mm. solo a lot and uh just being out on the mountain by yourself and then sitting on the top of a mountain having a sandwich and a beer by yourself yeah is yeah pretty, pretty epic <laughs> yeah i bet yeah. hey knowing that i feel like there's nobody else on the planet hey yeah no kidding plus like i train clients all week long so by the time friday rolls around i'm just so sick of hearing my own voice i just like sure. want to go out be by myself right left outside. no no your other left <laughs> no your other left <laughs> yeah no lead team <laughs> yeah, lead <exactly>. team <laughs> yeah yeah i hear you yeah um it, okay i got a question for you regarding that how many or can you recall a time doing that where you're like oh shit i think i fucking got myself into one here climbing hmm. it looks like there had to have been several times where you're like holy shit 
I don't know if I'm gonna make it, or you know what I mean. Maybe not make yeah, it. Yeah, a couple of them like. Yep. I don't, sorry, yep. I don't mean to interrupt, man. I, 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 I keep thinking about one video I saw. It wasn't that long ago where you were going straight, and if you slip left or right, we are not talking here today. Yeah. Like, what the fuck are you thinking? That was man? on <laughs> New Year's Day. I climbed, uh, what was that, Mount Holy Cross, I think. Okay. Yeah, out, by, out by uh, kind of Nanton area. At no point there, you were you were like worried or like oh Jesus, oh no, that, that I... one was puckering for sure. Yeah, oh it, was, my God. it was covered in snow and ice too, and it was extremely windy up there. Oh, but uh, dude, I can feel my pulse in my neck. I'd say the worst, the worst is when you're on slippery rocks that are loose, and you step on something and it just goes and goes and goes, right. and you're just like. This little voice in your head is like, if you fall, that rock could be you. Right, right. Oh <laughs> my god! Tumbling down into the abyss. <laughs> Jeez. But Between uh, that and skateboarding, what's the big deal about an organized fight, <laughs> hey? Yeah. My God. Um, do you have any favorites? Climbs. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I just love getting out and exploring different areas of the province, and the most, the more places I go, like we're so lucky to live in such a cool place. No kidding. Like, um, I've spent a bit of time up in Jasper National Park last year uh waterton national park which is such a cool area even um castle provincial park down okay. south like there's just so many cool areas i haven't even scratched the surface like i'm not gonna run out of mountains anytime soon so like i, I just i just don't understand man so do you just like drive and go like do you, have you pre-planned this or you're like mm, that one like yeah. do, you, do you drive and go or no, i plan yeah okay. i have i have uh, guidebooks and then there's actually some really good resources online and people will upload uh, their GPX files. Oh, nice. So you have it, you have the route loaded. Okay. And you know where you're going. I obviously have like a, a satellite communicator too. Okay. So if you do get in trouble, I can get helied off the mountain if okay. I need to. Had to use it ever? No. Thank God. No, yeah. Yeah, man. Holy cow. Um, You got one planned? When's the next one? Uh, after the fight. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. It's just such <laughs> like a gnarly day out, like, and I usually try to do it quick, and and then so your legs are a little bit sore afterwards. So sure. I don't want anything to detract from my skills training right now. Gotcha. Now, what about? Uh, I know, I, I know, this is a fight podcast, and we're talking about climbing mountains, <laughs> but this is so cool to me, to be honest. Um, so what about? So you just said, you know, oh, you know, hear my own voice, and you know, it's been a long week. I've been training hard. I've been training others hard. So now I'm gonna go climb a mountain. Is, is there ever a point where you're too tired for that? Like, maybe I shouldn't do it this time, you know, maybe next week. Like, or is this just, like, you just go? Yeah, I mean, you choose an objective that you feel you're ready to do. Hmm. Like, I wouldn't take on some, like, crazy 30-kilometer day if I was pretty pretty gassed. I would do something kind of easy. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Have you ever repeated any? Yeah, I have. I try not to, okay. just because there's so many. But sure. And in, in especially in seasons like this, where it's kind of like what we'd call like a shoulder season, there's only certain mountains that you can climb. Makes sense. Because some are just too dangerous, too much avalanche risk or whatever. So, right. Yeah. Right. Dang, man, that's awesome. Um, okay, listen, we can we, we can move on with that. That was great, man. I, I I watch you do it all the time, and I just have all these questions because I I know nothing about climbing mountains at all. So I was very curious, man. That's cool. Oh, thanks. Um, is that something you want to plan to carry on till you're seventy? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, just being more outdoorsy and get to more different places in general. I want to explore the states a little bit more nice. too. And yeah. If anything, that's something I want more in my life too. Just get out in nature, especially by myself. I want to do it by my, even if it's, I don't care if it's like a walk. I won't be doing that for a while. But yeah, just anything like that. Just get out in nature and and oh, I'm just I'm sorry, dad. I hope it's not my dad. Dad, you're early. Anyway. <laughs> um. All right, man. Back to fighting. So. What uh, so your your first title here in Airdrie? Now I also know. So you did a lot of competitions, tournaments, and stuff as well. Um, when did that start happening for you? Like, have you fought of the TBAs before? I didn't. Okay, I, with, I withdrew from the TBAs three times. Oh dang! Okay, <laughs> yeah. injuries it was like cursed. Yeah, yeah, injuries. Uh, two times broken rib, one time a broken foot. Oh Jesus! Yeah. Hey, the lady who runs it, Pam. Yeah, uh, Peterson. Uh, Peterson yep. Yeah, she like would probably know who I am just from emailing her to cancel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in this year. Yeah, we don't believe I've you. I've canceled like three flights to Iowa now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty bad. What uh, what tournaments have you been involved in? Uh, I've been to IKF mm. in... Uh, Florida? Florida, yeah, yeah, Orlando. And then I've been to WKA in uh, Virginia and when it was in New York. Right. Worst, worst tournament ever. WKA? <laughs> yeah. Why is that? It, it, well, in New York. I hear the horse. In New York, it was just 
unbelievably disorganized. I think I sat in the bleachers for like 70 hours. I had to Oof. go find my opponent, and he was about to go fly home. Really? And, uh, oh, boy. I was like, no, man, I'll get us in a ring. Like, next ring that's open. There was rings sitting empty for, like, hours. It was crazy. Weird. Yeah, so Weird. I was just like, okay, my opponent's ready to go fire us in this ring, and they did. Yeah, so, don't worry about the ref. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it <laughs> yeah, ourselves. Yeah. Jeez. So I've done that one, and then I did uh, IFMA the world, oh, right. world Championships a couple times. I did it in uh, Malaysia first, and then um, Belarus. Nice. And then I did IFMA Pan Ams twice. Um, first year was in Lima, Peru, and then the second year I went was in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dang, man, there you go. Oh, yeah, I do remember that, yep. Um, before we get to the big ones, let's talk about the, the sort of North American ones. How, how did you fare? How were the fights there? Did you get to fight anybody? Did you win? All that good stuff? They were good, yeah. I mean, the first time I went to WK, I traveled all the way to Virginia to fight Derek. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just hop, skip, and a jump from here. Yeah, which was <laughs> a, a good experience and a good fight. And then, um, I mean... Like, even in the States, like, at the higher levels, you just don't have that many guys in your bracket sometimes. Yep. So at IKF, I think I had, like, three fights the one year, and then I can't even remember, to be honest. And then uh, WK, that year it was terrible. I just had one fight. Brutal. So, yeah, mm. it's a long ways to go and a lot of money to spend for one fight. But sure, it sure. Keep, it keeps you busy between local fight cards, then it's right. worth, worth it, I think. And, and I think there's a lot to say besides the fight of learning to cut weight while you're traveling and all that other stuff, right? How, you know, things go wrong, the weigh-ins are wrong. Like, it's all shit you got to deal with. So, yeah, totally. You know. And I think just being at international tournaments and, like, seeing what everyone's doing and, like, just seeing that many fights, it just makes you a better fighter. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah, how, how, would, how is that guy working in the corner? What are they doing over there? Yeah, yeah, it's cool to be just part of that whole thing, hey? Yeah, or you see what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, wow, that, that guy's hit like eight rounds of pads before his fight. <laughs> oh, now he's gassed. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Am I doing something wrong? Like, oh no, never mind. We're we're doing it right. Yeah. Um, what uh, and how about how about some success there? Any notable names or titles that you took away from these tournaments? Um, At least uh, the North American style. I won every year I went to in the states. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think I you won every states. tournament. Yeah. Fuck yeah, man. Yeah. Nice. I mean, yeah, it's not. There wasn't crazy level of opposition, really, but it was the tough guys. I remember at IKF, I fought a couple guys. One guy was like some, he had like quite a lot of fights. He was like a Taekwondo world champion or something. He tried to wheel kick my head off. Of course he did. <laughs> Steven Thompson gave me the belt that year, too, which was cool. Oh, nice. There you go. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just good experience, just racking up those amateur fights. And I mean, I think that more Canadian fighters still need to do that i know the ontario crowd is still big into going to tba and yeah. stuff like that but i think it's a rock with all these tournaments yeah, right it's totally. so far for us yeah but you just have to do it you that's have right to take your amateur career into your own hands because yep. like the rest of the world is just lapping us when it comes to getting amateur experience yeah yeah they really are but uh we we need to take advantage of everything we can if you're sitting around waiting for a local promoter to put you on like two or three cards a year you're just not going to get that experience right it, and that's not fair in my opinion that's not fair the, for, for the promoter either you know yeah. that's not fair for them um I interesting now i know you had a question on there that you asked if anybody had some questions i know so we're kind of on this topic here so we'll just kind of get into it what do you think more amateurs need to do then like like how how do we in canada get these fights for the amateurs to, to at least start us on the path to catching up to the rest of the world we definitely need some kind of like structure i wish that muay thai canada was more of a body that existed <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I'm does not, it even I'm not, I'm not even really sure what stage it's at right now yeah me neither it was yeah. kind of left in the lurch and i know some people are trying to step up and make it happen but okay. it's a big a big project and uh but I just think we just need to look south and see what USMF is doing. And mm -hmm. they've got this huge network of amateur tournaments Yeah, I mean, now. development leagues. Uh, the Youth Development League yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can literally probably, the leaders of Muay Thai Canada could probably talk to them and kind of almost copy the blueprint and yeah. just take it up here. And because we need amateur tournaments that get people a lot of experience in a short amount of time. That's right. Like if you're if your amateur career is like eight or ten years and you're only putting together twenty fights, yeah. Like some cat from Belarus is doing twenty four fights a year. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, exactly. It's really hard, especially if you want to compete at the higher international level, 
like if Muay Thai is ever in the Olympics, which I probably don't think it will be, but might be this might be an unpopular opinion. I don't want it to. Yeah, I don't, I don't want I'm it to go to the Olympics. I'm kind of with you too. Yeah, yes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, like we just need to build the amateur scene up more, and then there needs to be more fight cards and more yeah. tournaments. Like, yeah. and people are like, oh, I don't want to fight with gear on and whatever. It's like, man, you go fight at if my you fight four times in five days or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, you'll be begging for more gear. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You'll be banged up. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think that people <coughs> should shy away from that kind of stuff, and it'd be nice to see more of it. I agree. Do you think at all? And I'm not. I'm not knocking anything or shitting on anything or so of course you got to say that before you come up with the next thing to say here um it's my understanding that to hold a fight card is an actual financial risk due to commission costs and stuff like that do you think that might play a part in it oh absolutely especially yeah. in calgary like there's a reason yeah, calgary specific there's a reason boxing promoters are doing cards in like Tabor and cold lake it's because their commission charges nothing compared to calgary tens of thousands they, of dollars yeah, i understand the calgary commission like i've seen their their fee structure break down years ago mm. and it just didn't even make sense to me like i remember um on a lot of the amateur cards like your glove runner is a kid from the gym yeah he's like sweet i get free tickets and i get to see the fighters like okay. right right on the calgary commission cards the glove runner is getting paid like I can't even remember what the actual number was, so I'd just be talking out of my ass. Sure. But I think it was like north of five hundred dollars. Like, yeah, and they get like per diems and this and that. Really, it's like, bro? It's like, I'm dude, signing up to be a glove runner. <laughs> yeah, it's like, dude, <laughs> pack a lunch. Like, you live in Calgary, you don't need a per diem. No, you don't. So it's Good just call. All help these... help out the promoters yeah. to promote. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know if it was the UFC coming to town that gave them this kind of like inflated idea of how much fight cards make, but like I can tell you, there's not a lot of promoters. Like, I'm sure Kieran does well because he's got a good business sense and he has right. good sponsors. Yep. And and done it w around the planet, literally. Yeah, exactly. So he's got the acumen for it. But I don't think other promoters are making any kind of cash in this sure. game, you know? So and, and so why would you with the amount of headache, honestly? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's you have to do it for the love of the game, basically. Yeah. And that'll <laughs> like, only take you so far. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I also am wondering, too, like... Mm -hmm. It's it's so hard to get any sort of funding for in in Canadian sports, not just Muay Thai, Canada sports. I'm sure when when you look at uh, besides the other countries around the world, but even the U.S., like there's there's a lot of m not money, you know what I mean, but money for sure. But sponsor push, you know, there's that we just don't see up here in no. any athletics, really. No, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm glad that we put money into other things than just having the best sportsmen and hell whatever. yes thank like, god like <laughs> belarus and russia like it's like i get obsessed it obsessed with that right? true but and at the but, but at the same time please don't let me be russian or belarusian yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah we do i think we do need to support our athletes more and yeah. and uh yeah try to develop our sports more and it's kind of it is a little bit weird how there's such a hierarchy of sport in canada like mm -hmm. uh i'm sponsored by a a supplement company that sponsors a number of uh like olympians let's give them a shout out man who is it uh pure vita labs pure vita labs yeah. shout out to them they're great great products and um yeah it's just crazy seeing like like some of these athletes they're like oh yeah toyota gave me the new forerunner to drive around <laughs> blah 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 i'm like i had to buy my own tracksuit <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> like okay good call <laughs> yeah so i don't know it's just yeah there is definitely a hierarchy of like importance in Canadian sport and it'd be nice if combat sports or Muay Thai or anything yeah. got a little bit but let's just get it legal across the country before we talk about funding it yeah eh? that's another thing yeah, yeah yeah um so when do you think in your opinion you went from amateur to pro when and I see that that was one of your questions when's the time when's the time to turn pro um I mean I think that you should build a decent resume as an amateur before you turn pro agreed um, yeah, just out of curiosity your own thoughts is there like a number 20 fights 30 fights 50 fights the, is there titles is there i don't know if there's a number so a much benchmark? as there's like a level yeah yeah like I agree. you should be able to compete with like people in your weight class from other countries and not get just molly whopped mm -hmm. and then you could probably go pro or i think you should maybe try to clear out most of the amateurs in your weight class in your region that's how it should be really yeah so from what i hear you say stay amateur as long as you can for the most part like you know making it a rough sentence and i mean 
especially in Canada, because there's just due to the legalization issues and everything, there's really only one promotion you can fight or yep. two promotions, Fight Life yep. and Muay Thai World Cup yep. that you can fight professional for. Um, yeah, the like well dries up once you turn pro. Pro Muay Thai is not legal in Ontario. It's not legal in Quebec. It's not legal in Saskatchewan, BC. Like, yeah, it's pretty crazy. I think pro kickboxing is legal in BC now, but Muay Thai isn't yep. Yep. or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm misspeaking, but no, whatever. It does. Yeah, it's confusing. It is. So I would say, yeah, just stay amateur as long as you can because once you turn pro, like, if you're not used to hustling to get fights, like, you're not going to get any opportunities. Right, right. Yeah. And because the well dries up, I also feel like, and I was really worried about this with Chris McMillan, is once the well dries up, those those sharks who are already pro in the top of their country are begging for fights. So the second you turn pro at that weight class, they can't wait. Let's get them in. Like, I need a fight, yeah, right? No. And so now you're getting fed to the sharks. Yeah, and you've seen that sometimes in Muay Thai too. Like Muay Thai, I think, is a lot different than boxing, where in boxing, when you turn pro, they will like feed you specific guys to yep. build you. Yep. In Muay Thai, it's that. Yep. You're like, you might never win a fight again if you turn pro at the wrong time. Right, right. And I've seen that happen to guys. Like they turn pro, they take like a vicious beating their first couple of fights, and then they're just like, I'm done with this. Right. Okay. No going back now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Which for sure. Kind of. Well, unless you're from Ontario, then you can have like X number pro of <laughs> pro fights and go back. But I think they do that because it's uh, pro Muay Thai is still illegal there. So. Right. Right. But yeah, it's all kind of confusing. Yep. I agreed. I agree. Um, now, how about your international tournament? So what was the first one you, you did internationally? The first one I went to was uh, Langkawi, Malaysia, IFMA. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about your your first IFMA experience, like, like getting, besides the fight, like just what was it like being part of that whole thing? It was pretty cool. Um, that was when Muay Thai Canada was definitely a lot more of like a force. And uh, there was a pretty good team from kind of all over the place. Yeah. And uh, trained really hard. Unfortunately, like I literally got my nose broken sideways like two days before we flew to Malaysia. Come on. Yeah. Got Come on. Elbowed super hard in the nose by someone who wasn't wearing an elbow pad and my nose was like boom sideways wow. and i was like well i gotta try <laughs> who did it uh <laughs> i'm not oh so. okay okay <laughs> maybe once we're off <laughs> yeah and then uh yeah in malaysia unfortunately like i think I, you could probably find it online it's like embarrassing but <laughs> i think guy i fought like touched my nose and there was just blood <laughs> rocketing out of my out of my throat and down my nose or down my throat out of my nose sure like, up your mouth it was brutal yeah Dang. my nose was demolished after that for a long time oh dude so yeah. it was already smashed and then somebody hit it the, oh yeah literally God. the first punch of the fight to turn yourself into gonzo yeah. man yeah yikes so, it was a cool experience though i mean going to if world championships is definitely a crazy experience because you're just immersed in all the other countries yeah you get to see like how people train um different styles of muay thai and there's got to be that yeah. little bit behind in your head that like i'm going to ifma i am going to get fucking hurt oh, win, yeah. win or lose i'm gonna oh, be fucking yeah. hurt oh yeah you know when you go to, i think it's the hardest tournament in sports hell seriously. good call man because like people like i've heard people say that like some wrestling tournaments are as hard but i'm like yeah, but you're not striking each other, really. Like, you're getting bumped up and bruised, but, like, if my you're making weight every single day that right. you fight, including the first day to set the bracket, and if you fight right. every day, you're making weight every day. Right. And then... While well, you've just depleted energy like crazy. Yeah, you're fighting the best guys in the world, like... And people love to say, oh, it's just amateurs. It's like, no, no it's like, not. <laughs> Super Bond was there. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. Yon Sinclair has yep. from a goal. Artem. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So... You're getting super banged up. Yeah, you know when you go to IFMA, you're getting hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah sure. The plane ride back's going to suck. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, now, was it soured a little bit? Like you said, you're super competitive. So does, was that kind of a uh, maybe a not souring experience, but not as blossoming as you were hoping on your first go? I mean, it definitely kind of sucked, especially watching, like, like sitting there and watching the guys in my bracket compete after that and being like, man. I just want to compete against these right, guys. Right, right. I, I got knocked out in the first round. I can fight round. that guy. I can fight that guy. Yeah, I yeah, got, I like, you. knocked out of the tournament because it's all single elimination, so. Oh, brutal. Yeah. Well, man, obviously it has to be. Yeah. Um, any, who were your teammates that year? Um, I honestly don't even really remember all of them. There was, uh, 
I would honestly have to look at the picture. Is that right? Eh? I get the years blurred together uh, between Belarus and, and Cowie. Okay. Yeah, I remember, I think Zach Darling was oh, yeah. Yeah. there. WTM, yeah. yeah. And then um, Mark was there. Nice. Mark McKinnon? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I can't remember. Oh, Kelsey Andrews was there. Oh, she yeah. She yeah. won gold that year, which yep. was epic. Uh, Janice McCauley was there. She okay. fought Valentina Shevchenko. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, that was when that group crazy. all went. Hey, that yeah. the team Spanish girls. Yeah. There. yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, so it was good. Yeah, good crew. So when did you go between Malaysia and Belarus? Was that the next year? No, Malaysia was like 2014, and Belarus was I think 2017. Okay. So it was a couple of years I didn't go. Okay. Yeah. What did you take away between between the two? Like, so you got there, you got a little taste. Unfortunately, you know, it was got smashed to pieces, but. <laughs> What, what did you take on your second goal? Like, okay, these are the things that I, I, I need to prepare for or do. Um, I would say just, like, seeing how high the level was. Mm. Like, even mm. though I was fighting in the – I was fighting in, like, the B class, right. they used to call it. Now yeah. it's called, like, I think competitive class or something. Okay. And uh, I was fighting in that class. Even then I was like, man, these – like there's no difference really between the B class and A class. Sometimes it's like yep. the dude who won national team trials and the dude who lost. That's it. right. That's right. You know. Yep. So it's like yep. they're That's true. they're both super good. And just realizing like you have to change your style a little bit in those tournaments. You can't like you can't really fight like a fight card. You have to be a little more uh, strategic with how mm -hmm. you fight because you're fighting again the next day. So right. You can't go out and just take pieces out of your shins. Right, like, right. Yeah. Yeah, you can't go for broke like it's your one and only. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got no. you. I got you. Um, what did you take away from Belarus? Who'd you get to fight there? Belarus, I did a little bit better. That was a fun tournament. Um, really cool, interesting, weird country to go to. I bet. But uh, I fought um, Belarus in the first round. Tough. Yeah, he was super tough. And like impossibly large. I was like, how the heck are you making <laughs> weight? He was like 6'2", <laughs> like... Yeah, wow. big kid. Really nice kid, though. We actually still chat. Oh, cool. Yeah, and um, I beat him um, a decision, and I, I, it was a good fight. I cut him with an elbow, and, mm. like, they had trucked in, like, maybe a 1,000 Belarusian soldiers to fill the stands. So oh, yeah? So everyone was just going crazy. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, it was, pretty, it was a pretty cool environment. Nice. And, uh, yeah, and then the next day I had to fight a guy from uh, Team Turkey. Not and, a tough country. Uh, yeah, so I basically got out, and we fought like almost last that day, and mm. I got out of the ring and had to go <coughs> cut, had to go cut weight. So really, yeah, because you got to weigh in the next day. If you're I get, oh, the you're next the last fight of the day. At like how strange! Seven in the I just morning. won. I'll go cut weight. Yeah, so I didn't get to bed till super late because I was cutting weight, and then uh, and like when you're that close to the fight, the only weight cut method you can use is sweating it out. So right, the worst. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, fought Turkey the next day and just uh, lost a decision. I thought I thought I should have won. I dropped him with a body shot and somehow lost a, a three-round fight. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course. I don't know. Of course, eh? But it was tough, and he was a tough guy. He, he had a lot more experience than me, and it was uh, – he, he, like, was crafty. You could, yeah. You could tell. So, it was good. And then, uh, yeah, so I lost in, like, what was that, like, the quarterfinals, which kind of sucked. But hmm. those yep. tournaments, too, like – the the draw really matters too, sure. right? Without like a doubt. Sometimes you'll have countries that aren't notoriously strong, and then you'll have like Russia, Belarus, Turkey. Right. Like, so yep. depending which path you get, you could have a pretty cruisy ride to the final, or you can just, just like drag through hell, face a bunch of murderers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, what an absolute like, like everybody going to these tournaments <coughs> on that airplane, like you're you're <coughs> deliberately. Uh, putting yourself in the trenches, weight cut late at night every day. Like, what? What a? What's wrong with all these people going? Like, getting what? You know what you're getting into, but you're still going anyway, and you're paying. <laughs> yeah, wild. Um, you also fought Bangkok, IFMA as well. Uh, I went to Bangkok to fight at IFMA, but unfortunately, I got like a super bad injury right before the tournament. Oh no! I was training at FA Group, and uh, oh yeah, yeah. I got like swept in the clinch, and the guy landed on me weird. Okay, and. And uh, my rib actually separated, like oh. where your uh, cartilage and bone join, yep. like popped open. So oh my, my God. rib was like sticking out, and it like it sounded like when you push in a pop bottle and it goes like, and it pops. Oh out. yeah, like, it yeah. was like audible. Like I heard it. I was like, oh shit. 
and uh, oh, so I couldn't do anything. Like I could barely move, could barely breathe. So I had to withdraw from the tournament when I was already there, oh, which sucked. Dude. And, like I, we were like pretty much stuck there because we had uh, uh, rented our condo out while we were oh, away. okay. So I couldn't even change my flights and go back. Right. So like we just stayed at the at the uh, in Thailand, which like. Yeah, it ended up being like a shitty vacation. Sure, sure, <laughs> yeah. Super painful rip. Were they able to do anything at the time? No, I just basically uh, had like a little like compression thing that wrapped around it and just tried not to aggravate it. Oh, my it God. It took a long time to heal. That injury was like probably worse than when I've actually broken my ribs. Yeah, yeah, I bet, hey. Yeah. God damn. That sucks. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, really. Do you, does it still affect you today? Is it weakened or anything or? No, don't even think about it. Nice. That's good. That's good. Um, so then how long was it then? So after all these, in my opinion, once you've done these kinds of things, like you've done now, you've done the the North American circuit, you've done IFMA and uh, like we've talked about, you can still be super bond and Janssen Klai and fight at IFMA. It doesn't really matter. In my opinion, if you're doing these tournaments, you're going to compete and all that. And it's been several years in a row, probably safe to turn pro. Did yeah, you, no, for sure. And uh, I mean, for me, turning pro was more so um, just because I got such a wicked opportunity. Mm. Like, I turned pro when I fought main event in Vegas against Naropal. Oh, right, was, right. That's right. I mean, how can you say no to that? Sure, like, sure. Kieran lined that up with Triumphant, and I was like, yeah, absolutely, I want to do that. Nice. How did so, it feel yeah. moving around in there with him? Near upon Fairtex. I mean, it's like moving or it's like playing chess against someone who knows all the moves that you're gonna do before sure. you do them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. W- was there was there any point where like you felt that? Where you were like uh, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. We've all sort of been there if you know maybe not, but like sometimes you can tell right away, you're like, oh shit, this might be a long night. Or sometimes you're like, Oh, I can, if I can just do this, this, this. Like was there was it early that you had that feeling or, or was it looking back on it that you have that feeling? I think it's kind of looking back on it, because during the fight, like I feel like he is so crafty that he could feel like I hit him a few times Mm -hmm. with some shots. I think I got him like with a couple crosses and body crosses and kicks. And I could tell that he like kind of adjusted. He's like, oh, this kid can actually like hit pretty hard. Like I don't want to get hit by him. So Mm -hmm. I'm just going to I'm just going to be a tactician. I'm going to ride the ropes. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely did that. Be be super like strategic and just not get hit. Yeah. And, like, he did that, and I didn't know how to alter my game plan at the time. Mm. Like, I just kind of tried the same thing for five rounds, and it didn't work. So, What would you do differently now? I would just get in his face and pressure him. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, I suppose so, hey, if he's allowed to to wait back. Try to get in a clinch and tire him out and whatever, but, I mean, who knows? That might not have worked at all, but at least it would have been different, right? Right, right. (laughs) Well, and so what? You're allowed to go back and look and say, if I could do it again, this is what I'd do different. Yeah, no, totally. No problem. Um, and then, so how long was it after that, that you had your, the first ever WBC Canadian champ right here, by the way, first ever when, uh, how long did that happen afterwards? Or did you have another fight in between? Um, I fought, when was that? 2000? Yeah, no, I didn't fight in between. I don't think. Yeah. So that was that later that, uh, winter, I think. Yeah. November. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. How was it like being part of a, uh, sort of the first Muay Thai world cup? It was big. I mean, I, it even kind of caught me a little bit like, holy shit. Uh, and then fighting for the WBC title. How did that all feel against Phil Ingroth? Ah, oh, that was pretty cool. That was an awesome card. It was like, I think there was like 2,200, 2,300 people yeah, there. Yeah, it, it was like wild. really loud. Biggest show I've fought on on Calgary. Just got to clear my throat. Yeah, do so. <coughs> yeah, biggest show I've fought on in Calgary and um, just like pretty electric, uh, cool atmosphere. Trained really hard for that fight. And, uh, Phil, I knew he was tough. He had, like, a lot more pro experience than I did. So Mm. I was, Mm -hmm. like, one of those fights where you're kind of, like, not scared of the fight, but, like, it keeps you on edge, you know? Sure. Because you know it's going to be a hard fight, win, lose, or draw, right? Yeah, yeah. And now, so you got knocked, it was back spinning elbow you got knocked down with, right? Yeah. And and, and listen, man, I I know you know, too, it was was on the fence. It could have been stopped. It could not have been stopped. More, more importantly, and by the way, shout out to Wayne who sent this to me, who said that your comeback might be, uh, uh, the, the, I don't know if it was Canadian, but the, the best comeback he, he personally has seen in sports history. Um, it was so close. It was so possible to being stopped. And then you come back. Now, was it the same round? Um, no, I think I, <clears throat> I survived that round and kind of like 
picked up. I think I even won the end of the round, and then yeah, uh, yeah. Or some, yeah, and then the next round was when when I won the fight. So how was it? How were you? Maybe maybe you weren't even there. Well, where were you when you got knocked down and the refs counting and it's 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 close, man. You know what I mean? Like, obviously getting your 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 thoughts together, your feet together. What was going through your mind at that point? I mean, I don't even really remember the heat of the moment, but I just remember like feeling fine, like head wise. And, like, when you get your equilibrium rocked like that, like, your brain and your body just aren't, like, yeah. M- yeah. synced up. So yeah, been there. I remember just being kind of, like, feeling a little wobbly. <clears throat> but then, like, quickly got my legs back under me, and I was just, like, like, I always am when I'm down in a fight. I'm like, fuck this shit. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm not losing this. I'm going to win this That's fight. That's it, yeah. I'm going to win this fight or you're... I'm gonna die trying. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 is what you were taught saying to yourself. Oh yeah. Do you remember anything in between in the corner in between the ne- you know that round and the next one? I'm sure. I'm sure it had to be some kind of epic speech in there. I mean, <laughs> if you even know you know can tell your ass from last Tuesday at the time. I just think. Got down. I think Kieran just said something to me like, "This is your fight to win. Go win it," or something like that. Yeah. And and I was just like, "Yeah, fuck this. I'm gonna go win this fight." Nice. Yeah. And I mean, when I replayed in my head, it was grab him by the back of the head. And just lob his head off with an elbow or elbows. Uh, what was that feeling like? I mean, it was pretty, like, if you watch the highlight of it, it's pretty, like, pretty brutal. Sure. Um, that was the worst injury I actually had from that fight. My forearm was just annihilated and my elbow was so swollen. From the get, elbows. Oh, yeah. I had to get, like, Damn! fluid drained out of my elbow. Uh, yeah, Is that it was, right? It was like, Full on, man. Oh, yeah. My arm was, like, twice the size the next day. Oh, but uh, yeah. think about Phil's head. Just wet. Yeah. I mean, he's a tough guy. Sure is. I just had to go full, full berserker mode, basically. Yeah. Just kind of. Yeah. Were, were you? Uh, I'm just trying to live in your your my eyes here. Were you? Were you looking down at him? Like, was was that? Were you like watching the eight count? You know, were you like, come on, man? Like, this could be it. Like, was it the uh, longest eight count of your life? You know what I mean? Like. Well, I mean. Like, even in the heat of the moment, you get three eight counts around, yep. and then the fight's over. Yep. So the, the last eight count was actually number that's three. That's right, that's right. So yep, I, knew, right. I knew the fight was over before he even started, or before right. he even finished the count. Right. So, like, a lot of people <clears throat> were saying this and that and whatever, but I'm like, man, you get three eight counts in a round. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not the one making the rules. Right, right. So... And, and you know, hey, man, to be honest, and, and I've read it and heard it all too. I've, I've heard what people have to say, but here's the bottom line. That has nothing to do with you. No. You yeah. did your damn job. That's we, it. We both showed up and we did our job. That's and it. And we put on a hell of a fight. End of. Yeah. Yep, end of. That's <coughs> it. I agree. Um, w- did you, was there a nice big relief at the end? You knew it was over. You know you're the champ. W- what, what was going on then? I mean, any fighter who says they're not relieved when a fight ends is a liar. Sure, sure. <laughs> Anytime you hear the bell or you see the ref going like this, like you're like immediately like, oh. yeah, because <laughs> I, I love fighting. and But, yeah, when the fight is over, that's the best feeling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no for kidding. Sure. Especially when you're on the, re- on the dub side. That's right. right. Yeah, of yeah. course. Um, I remember speaking to you at the end of the night. And uh, I, I only wanted to say, hey, congrats, how do you feel that stuff? And I remember you just looking past me like a thousand yard stare and just being like, oh, dude, I, uh, I just can't do this right now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, are you fucked up? Like, like what, at the end of the night, how were you feeling? I mean. It was literally on our way yeah. out. It, the fights are done. We're I on think, our way out. I think I was just like drained mentally because it was such like a big, like, climactic moment in the fight and like it was very dramatic so like mm-hmm. every single person who watched that fight wanted to come and say something I to me afterwards jay fuck off so like <laughs> no yeah <laughs> beat it yeah uh, i hear you i hear you it's but, okay you can uh, say it. no like after after a while like and i always i'm like the same after any fight i'm like oh we're gonna go out and have th- drinks and this and that and get a bunch of food and i have like one beer and then like talk to 300 people i'm like i want to go home and go to bed yeah yeah i want to <laughs> yeah i yeah. want to go home to my dogs <laughs> yeah i hear you man yeah. nice um i'll tell you if there's any a couple of remem- uh, memories i have of that fight it's also uh if if uh i wish everybody on the planet that has a father gets the support and, and and the adrenaline that your dad had, man. He was on the catwalk screaming like nobody was watching him, and he didn't give a shit. That, to me, was like, 
That was pretty amazing. That's fatherhood yeah, right there, I remember, man. That's fatherhood. I remember being in the ring, actually, and looking over, because they had this, like, raised catwalk that led to the ring. And my dad was standing, <laughs> like, he had climbed up on the <laughs> catwalk. Right. I think there was, like, maybe even, like, a divider. And he, like, somehow got over and was on the catwalk, just like, yeah. Yeah, man. And yeah. I was like, holy shit, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a two-sided coin. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying my dad never had that kind of pride in me. But when you get to see it, hey, you always wish... I hope my dad has that much pride in me. And at the same time, I also want to be that dad that take that much pride in my son and get that much involved. That was something epic, man. That was yeah, cool. That was a pretty cool moment for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, now, so that pretty much brings us to like almost, <clears throat> I guess I, I guess a few questions I have. We have a few from the fans, but so let's start with, with that. So since, <clears throat> since that fight, have you fought from then until your fight coming up here April 5th? Yeah, I fought in Mexico. Oh, in right. Acapulco. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? If you're a cat, you got seven left. Yeah. <laughs> How did, what, why? What? I mean, <laughs> this organization contacted me, I think on Instagram, and wanted, they were putting together this international fight card kind of thing in Acapulco, and uh, they wanted me to fight. And I was initially supposed to fight, I think, some Polish guy. And then they uh, changed it to fighting um, Miguel. Um, Torres, I think his last name Yeah, I think is. so, yeah. And uh, he had won IFMA the year before at, like, 78 kilos or something. Mm. Or maybe 81 kilos. 81. Like, he's a big dude. He's mm. huge. And uh, so they put they put him in there, and it was going to be a cool card. I knew some Americans who were going, too. So. Right. Yeah, we went down to Acapulco, even though there's, like, a travel advisory yeah, against man. going there. And, yeah. and had another absolute tear-up. Another absolute tear-up. Yeah, it was... Uh, a good fight. Um, I dropped him. He dropped me. Yep. And yeah, I don't know. Score it however you want. But at the end of the fight, <laughs> they they had it scored for me. And then they literally, in front of everyone, took an eraser on the other side of the pen er 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 pencil, erased the scorecards, yep. changed the scores. Yep. Like in front of the camera, the guy, w the one guy, was <laughs> filming it, and then. Uh, they brought us back in the center of the ring after like 35, 40 minutes, and they took the belt away from me, raised his hand. I was like, oh. I, I, I don't know if I saw that part, but I saw the ending, and I, I watched it live, and I thought the best thing you did was when, in my opinion, I'm probably and clearly the school judges, when the wrong guy won, you went, hmm, and then walked away. I was like, oh, that's probably the smartest thing you could ever do. Yeah, I was just <laughs> like, Okay, get me home. <laughs> That whole trip, we had a saying, Jake and I, we were just like, expect the unexpected. There expect the unexpected. Every single thing that happened was like completely, like even just getting to Acapulco, I was like stuck in Mexico City. I was like staying at some random guy's house for like two days in Mexico Good City. Lord, man. And uh, <laughs> like in the hills, like in a compound outside the city. Holy. Yeah, it was nice, but I was like, why am I here? No like, kidding. Oh, I'm not making it to the fight. And then, uh, yeah, just like all kinds of weird weird shenanigans the whole time and sure then, and then that so yeah after that happened i was just like i need a beer no <laughs> joke hey get me out of here no kidding man yeah. oh good god i need a beer and a stack of tacos that's right yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh shit i love mexico but that sounds sketchy yeah <laughs> um which so so i let's let's talk about this question i have right now because it kind of plays into it here so i got a question from a fan why the long layoff between this fight coming up April 5th and your last fight or two in this case? So um, after Mexico, I actually had a really bad uh, infection in my leg. Oh. I had like uh, MRSA and flesh-eating disease in my leg. What? From a cut. I kicked his elbow and it cut my shin open. Oh, my God. And I was actually cornering at Muay Thai World Cup when my leg started feeling super painful. Okay. So I know the fight doctor, and I texted him, and I was like, hey, man, do you think between fights you could come look at my leg? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, he came, and he was like, you need to go to the hospital immediately. Jesus. And, uh, so that took, like, months to resolve. And then after that, I actually hurt myself hiking. I fell and uh, sprained my wrist really bad. And then that got better. And then I was training for... I wanted to be on, so after Mexico, I was actually on Team Canada. I was supposed to go with them. I can't remember. I think it was in Thailand again. Mm, yeah. And I said, like, hey, I can't do this. Like, I have this crazy leg infection. And uh, they they 
weren't happy that I had withdrawn. And um, <laughs> so they didn't let me go. To, they, like, took me off the team for the next world championships, which was actually, like, sometimes it's, like, weird. It's not years apart. Right. It, it was only, like, several months apart. Right, so okay. So it was in spring, in the spring and uh, last year, and they were just like, oh, you're not on the team. And I was like, oh, okay. So hmm. I basically did this, like, whole fight camp preparing to be on the team, and they are like, no, we're n you're not on the team. Hmm. And... Uh, so I was like kind of jaded with the whole scene sure. after that point. I was just like, man, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. And uh, coming back from those injuries and stuff and then getting kind of snubbed like that a little bit. It's just I wish there was like a better trials process. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's really I don't, we don't, hold, have I don't really. hold it against against them or whatever, but it just kind of sucked. Yep, for sure. And um, And then – Shortly after that, I was skateboarding and, like, destroyed my other wrist. I fell oh so hard, like, did a bum drop on the concrete and, like, bent my wrist behind me so bad. So that Yikes. that was, like, most of last year dealing with that injury. And then uh, I wanted to come back and fight in the fall, and then uh, I had a fight lined up in New York mm. for a Warriors Cup, All and right, right. I broke my rib, like, two weeks before oh, the right, fight. right. So. Yeah, so just like a string of unfortunate events, sure. a little bit of time there where I wasn't sure if I even wanted to keep fighting just because I was just kind of jaded with the Canadian scene. Sure. And, uh, I'm, yeah, just kind of exploring other things, climbing a lot of mountains. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and, you know, with COVID in there, I mean, it's everyone had to take a break from fighting. Right? Yeah. Well, let's roll on with these couple questions here before we're out of here. Um, why long left? Uh, where has been your favorite place to fight? <clears throat> That's a tough one because uh, I really, really liked Lima, Peru, and I really liked Buenos Aires. So oh, I'd yeah? say South America. Oh, yeah? Uh, How come? Um, they're just – the food is amazing. Mm. The climate is nice. It's really pretty. Um, I try to speak Spanish. <laughs> sure, sure. And, um, yeah, it just – Buenos Aires was such a cool city. I definitely want to go back to Argentina and spend more time uh, touring around there. Nice. Yeah, such a cool place. And that was for a tournament as well, right? That was for Pan Ams, yeah. Right, right. Um, here's a good one. What are your top three favorite Muay Thai memories? Top three memories? Probably winning a gold medal in Argentina after fighting four times in three days. Yeah, and you were down there by yourself too, I think. Uh, nope. No, that was Lima. Oh, okay. I was down there with Ben Pride. Just oh, yeah, Me yeah. and Ben nice. cor cornering Shout each other. Shout out to other. Ben. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so that's probably number one, winning gold at Pan Ams, just because it was such a hard tournament. And then, uh, I don't know, really. Number two. Any other that just kind of pop in your head? Maybe not your favorite, but just pop in your head? I mean, maybe just fighting in, fighting in Vegas, main event for pro debut against a Thai legend. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then just, I don't know, just, yeah, I guess it's not a memory. It's just, like, the whole body of of work and the community that I have around me and the, the friends and the, the people I've met through the sport. Yeah, no, that's fair to say. Yeah. That, that's a good answer, in my opinion. Um, here's a good one. What are your f your favorite and least favorite fights that you've had? Favorite fight? <clears throat> I would say either the first title I won in uh, at the Deerfoot Casino. Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> Just because like I was, I've never been more in a flow state in my life. Like mm, who was that against? Uh, Andrew. Oh, Andrew, right, right. Like I just felt like <laughs> I was like in a complete flow state, so like conscious of everything. Everything was slow, so that's nice. kind of like sticks out to me a little bit. I've definitely found that state in other fights, but like that one was like pretty next level and then um least favorite fight probably that one in uh, Mal malaysia where i got punched once in the nose and sure. blood was shooting <laughs> everywhere <laughs> sure <laughs> that i was tried bad. the the ringside doctor came in and she was like trying to like stop the bleeding because it was so bad so she pinched my nose which Whoa. made all the blood go down my throat oh, and i was like was sick. i was like trying not to cough and then i coughed 
and just sprayed oh. her in the face with <laughs> I'm blood. I'm sorry. And she was just so horrified. <laughs> I was like, you plugged my nose. Yeah, what are you like, thinking? I, can't, I couldn't help it. I was choking. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm a loser. <laughs> <laughs> I lost and sprayed blood all over somebody. Yeah. Um, and I thought this was a really good one too, even though I think it's an easy answer. So with this uh, uh, Muay Thai Champions League coming around the world, the Hitman Fight League and uh, you know, think Australia and all that, um, Fitzpatrick is no longer fighting. How come you didn't take that spot? Well, number one, I already had a contract signed, and I'm a, man, April 5th. I'm a man of my word, and uh, I think that opportunity is more exciting anyways. And uh, number two, it's just too heavy. Like, yeah. I'm walking around at that weight right now, so yeah, well, I definitely don't want to fight guys who are cutting from, like, 185. Right. And, and not only that, but there, and then and then it's not just a fight. There, you're expected to proceed and do things yeah, afterward, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like... I've put on MMA gloves like twice in my life. Right. That's definitely definitely something I'm not going to do short notice. Sure, sure. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Real quick, I, I know we're a little over an hour here. That's What's good. your thoughts between that uh, uh, Muay Thai and four-ounce gloves? I have mixed feelings about it. Yeah, um, me too. A fighter who I really respect is uh, Toby the Weapon Smith. Hell yeah, shout out to Toby Smith. And... One thing that he always says is just, like, it changes the sport into being, like, some kind of, like, crazy violent spectacle. And you see these, like, absolute legends just get sparked out and then their career is done. Yep. Like. Nongo. Yeah, totally. And, yeah. like, even Yod Sinclai, like yeah. one of my favorite fighters of all time to yeah, watch. Me too. And uh, it just sucks seeing. But, I mean, if it gets more eyes on the sport, so it's kind of like it's yeah, the old double-edged sword. I yeah, don't know. I hear you. Yeah. And I was even curious, I asked Tim, who was on the last podcast too, like, was there any sort of part where you're like putting on these gloves, like, hey man, I, I didn't sign up for this when I <laughs> decided to fight Muay Thai. I thought we were going to be in gloves in five rounds. And, you know, like, I wonder how many other people feel that way, you know? Yeah, it definitely, like, it just seems like a different sport to me. Yeah. Like, it's a, is it exciting? Yeah, yep. but, like... Is it Muay Thai? No. I don't know. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, Definitely I agree. Different. The, 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 the strategy of Muay Thai over five rounds is what I love about Muay Thai. Yeah. And, 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 and don't get me wrong, I don't miss a Friday morning for the most part, but it is a different sport for sure. For yeah. Sure. Okay. No. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, man. So just before we're out of here, uh, first of all, you can give one shout out, one shout out of the podcast. Who do you give it to? Dunamis. Dunamis. Okay, that's a lot of people, but <laughs> I'll, I'll let you get away with that. <laughs> if I had to pick one person, probably Jake. Jake, yeah. yeah. Beauty. Good. Why? I, I pretty much know why, but, you know. He's just, yeah, he's just helped me find a, just find a better community, a better team, um, change how I look at competing in the sport, and, yeah, just... Especially coming from yeah. almost giving up, being a little jaded from it, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's so great, it's man. just it's awesome to be part of that team, and it's not just Jake. Like, there's other coaches there. Like, we're all. It's kind of a weird like we coach each other, mm -hmm. even though we're peers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. has to be that way. Yeah, yeah, it's such a good community, and there's like so many up and coming guys that fire me up too. Nice. And. Uh, just seeing them progress and improve like makes me want to do the same. Right. Like, it's like, man, I've been doing this for a long time and I can still learn so much from these young guys and like uh, they fire me up to get in there and train hard. Nice. Nice. Yeah. There you go. Jake, you get the shout out, man. <laughs> um, any sponsors? Anybody want to give a shout out to? Uh, I've got a few sponsors this fight camp that have helped me out. Uh, Got my sticker on my water bottle here. Fight Cartel. Nice. Uh, cool company in Vancouver. They're making some really good designs, some good shorts and hand wraps, some funny, yeah. st funny stuff too. And uh, Bridge on Market, uh, a nice little family-run grocery store in my neighborhood. Nice. They always hook me up. And uh, Proactive Health Group, keep my body moving. Um, Movement Sports Clinic, I go to physio there. Nice. Um, Pure Vita Labs. And, man, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Yeah. No worries, man. <laughs> you no guys worries. know who you are. <laughs> and uh, and uh, just before you're like, oh, wow, that guy has a lot of sponsors. He must be rolling in it. It's like most of these people hook me up with, like, stuff. It's not it's not Sure, money. not always financial. <laughs> yeah, it's not financial, but it's stuff that I need and stuff that I use. So it, it definitely all helps. Yeah, nice, man, nice. Yeah. Um, anything else before we're out of here, man? 
Oh, where do we find you on, on social media? All that good stuff leading up to April 5th here. Yeah, social media. You can find me. Um, my business Instagram is FightFitYYC. I do uh, strength and conditioning programming for fighters. I actually have quite a few fighters uh, in the States and out East. Nice. And um, my personal Instagram is Scott Smash McKenzie. Um, I don't use X or Twitter or whatever. Okay, yeah. And yep. uh, I'm not really on Facebook. Successful. Face- not really on Facebook. Uh, so Instagram is uh, the place, eh? Instagram is yeah. the place, yeah. Awesome. And uh, how about leading up to April 5th? People want to buy tickets, support you. What, what do we do? The best thing you can do, uh, they weren't able to get like a promo code, but they're just keeping track of uh, who buys tickets. So if you buy tickets to the fights, it's on Ticketmaster. If you just look up like Fight Life River Cree, it'll pop up immediately. Hmm. And on Ticketmaster. And then if you get tickets, just shoot me a message and uh, say, hey, Scott, I got... 20 tickets and uh, perfect maybe 30 <laughs> yeah exactly and, and so you get a cut obviously yeah awesome yeah. awesome uh, muakai is such a good promoter he always looks after the fighters so yep. i'm not worried about it at all awesome awesome man all right well listen man uh, i've known you for years uh I'm, I'm super thankful we get to I'm, it's always fight like I've, I've said this lots it's always fight time i hey man how was the weekend it's like ah, it's not the time for this man we all we're all busy and fighty so I never get to sit down and talk uh, to people, and this is one of my favorite things to do, man. So I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for and, having uh, me. And again, it doesn't—it doesn't have to be one and done, man. Fight cards, your post fight. Let's let's have at it again, and uh, I'll try to educate myself on some mountains. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. And uh, we'll see because there might be some more exciting news after this fight card. I always try to focus on what's right in front of me, but there's some uh, different stuff coming down the pipe too. So. Beauty, gives us a reason yeah. to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right, guys, there's another one. So another uh, co-main event here for uh, Fight Life April 5th. Make sure you go check that out out in River Cree. And I'm hoping, Mukai, talk to me. I'm hoping you guys will see me out there. Peace.